you know, I'm in that place now where uh, I'm getting to the epic ending, right? Everybody wants to get to the epic ending. And instead of one book, I've got two books that are bridging that. Uh, and so the danger for me is to write something that will bore people and have them not come back for book three or someone that won't mm -hmm. come back for book four for the epic ending. But what I've gotten is a, I've gotten some pretty decent reviews on book two. There's a lot of people that, um, you know, book one were rating me three and four that are now rating me four and five on Amazon or Apple books or wherever I go. And and I've seen, you know, a nice recurrence in sales from my newsletters and my uh, uh, and my email lists and stuff like that as I start to continue to build those. So from a, with you know business goggles on looking this way, you know, it's it's doing it exact. It, it's coming the plan is coming to fruition, you know, it's happening, right. you know, and the other side of it is continuing to put out good product and do it fast enough that it really aligns itself well with the, um, the marketplace that exists for me, because when you're writing fantasy, um, or science fiction, you know, you don't have lifelong fans in many instances, like horror, you can write and it's from eight to 80, you know, you've got folks, there's a real strong niche in fantasy, but a lot of those folks you pick up when they are, in my case, you know, you're talking Gen Zs and Gen Alphas um, and some millennials uh, because that's that's the target market that reads the stuff. And then there are the lifelong folks like me that have been into Star Wars and Star Trek since the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. Listen to the vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I would love to welcome back my buddy J.V. Hilliard, who is an author. And uh, we've had him on, talked about his last couple of books, and you've got a new one coming out, right? I do, and thank you very much for having me back. Oh, my um, pleasure. In the in the Warminster series, will be called the Trillius Gambit. Uh, it'll be book three in a four book series, and that should be out on the marketplaces um, anytime around March of 2023. Uh, and then book four will finish up in the summer, and the series will be. Uh, completed not necessarily completed forever but at least this four book series will be done and we'll see what happens after that so are you going on a book tour you know i've been doing some of that um and next year meaning this year the uh 2023 i'm going to be doing uh, a lot more of that the conventions uh the bookstores it, when my books started to come out in december of 2021 we were emerging from covid uh yeah. and there were some limitations to that so there were some folks that uh, were uncomfortable coming out. Some bookstores didn't even allow for that uh, at that point. But I started to bounce through the library circuit, some of the you know the book circuits, and then you know the convention circuits. You know we have a tendency to fit in pretty well as a you know high fantasy kind of series into various comic cons, yeah, uh, things like that. So I've been starting to do those mostly regionally, uh, but this year it's going to start out to be a little bit more national. I'm going to be you know, doing the tour with the Galaxy Con folks. And, you know, they Man. just got out of one in Columbus, Ohio. And, and the next one we're going to be doing will be in Richmond, Virginia. So um, it's uh, it's starting to heat up. And it, it, it makes more sense for me to do that kind of stuff now that I've got a, I'm, you know, three quarters of the way through a series. People have a tendency to like, you know, when it, in my genre in particular, they like to buy series. And so now I've got something more than a book to sell. Um, and I'm finding a lot of traction in those spaces. So uh, the answer to your question is yes, I will be doing a lot more of those. Uh, coming to Texas? I will be. I don't have a date yet. I'll be, there's a Texas and a Las Vegas swing, and I think it'll be in November. Um, and in part, uh, the November play ends in um, in Vegas because there is a, a big writer's convention out there uh, during the same week. So I think it'll be closer to, um, you know, November of, of 2023. So maybe 10 months from now, I'll be out your way and I'll let you know, man, we got to get together. Yeah, for get sure. Face. You don't know which one you're going to, do you? No, I do not know yet. Yeah. Well, well, I'll, I will, I'll let you know when my, my schedule gets worked through with, uh, uh, not only my publisher, but also, uh, some of the folks that are doing some of the promotions and things like that. So right now I don't have that schedule yet, but I know we're coming. Man, hopefully it's the Austin comic-con because that's the best one. Yeah, yeah, I've heard good things, I and mean, that's that's kind of my crowd. That college crowd likes my stuff. So, yeah, I tell you what, I've met some great folks out at those cons, and I, I used to be a security guard at uh, the HEB Center, and uh, that's that's actually where I 
got my first idea for doing this show, and that's because I made, met Adrian Paul. Do you know who Adrian Paul is? I sure do. I've got a Adrian Paul story myself, so I'll tell you in a second. Finish yours. <laughs> well, not really a whole lot of excitement to my story. You know, we When we were on break, they let us kind of wander through and check everything out. And, I mean, it's Adrian Paul. I had to stop and talk to him, right? And uh, I just came up and said, hey, man, I wanted to meet you. You know, I love your work, that kind of thing. And uh, at the time is when I first started having my back problems. And so I was using a cane. And so he questioned me about it. And I told him, you know, I got that disease that deteriorates my bones. And I said, I, I think it's something like arthritis. I'm not sure. I just know that it's something that happens to some people that get diabetes, right? And he sat there and gave me about 30 minutes worth of lecture on uh, treatments for arthritis. So that was the excitement of it all. <laughs> Mine comes at it from a little different angle. So uh, my my wife found out he was coming to the Pittsburgh Comic-Con. And this goes back maybe five years ago. And she just thought he was the sexiest from the Highlander show and mm -hmm. everything. Like that. And in fact, our dog is named McLeod. Uh, you know, and he, you might hear him in the background at some point during the show. Um, and of course she calls him Duncan McLeod. I call him Connor McLeod, nothing against Adrian, but Hey, the original is the original, right? So I got to, right. I, I, I defer back to, uh, to, to Connor, but you know, the long and short of it is she's like, you got to give me tickets. You got to give me tickets. So we got our tickets and, um, we, we end up going to the con and she walks up to him and he's like, Oh, do you, you know, uh, you know, are you, 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 what are you doing here? And he, she tells him, she's like, why? Well, I, I thought you'd, you'd want to take a picture with me, you know, like making it almost like she was the guest and he was there to take a picture with her. Uh, <laughs> and he started laughing about it and, and they shared a story and we ended up getting a, a replica sword at the con. There was a guy that was making these like movie quality kind of things. And he signed the katana, which we had in our game room for a number of years. So yeah, I still do, but you know, like she's a big Adrian Paul fan, so it's hard for me to live up to that. But you know what I mean? We all got a list, right? Adrian Paul's on hers, so I even got her for her birthday two years ago. I got her a there's a there's a an app called Cameo. Yeah, where you go on there and you pay whatever. Well, it was probably probably paid like a hundred bucks, and he gave her like a three minute birthday wish to her and stuff like that, and reminded her that he, he met her at. Uh, you know, at the Pittsburgh Comic Con and stuff like that, and she had it up on Facebook, and all of her friends are oohing and on, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, it was the uh, whatever. You know, hey, different strokes for different folks, right? So, but right. I do, and he seems like a pretty approachable guy, so I'm glad to hear he was sitting there giving you some advice, and you know, it's not the so unattainable types sometimes where you just can't go in and see them. He is so nice, and you know, I, I was doing a paranormal podcast at the time. But I'm like, how do you not ask somebody like that to could be on your show, right? Yeah, you got to take a run, right? So I'm like, you know, I do a podcast. Would you like to come on? And he goes, hold on. Pulled out his card and he says, here, um, just message me and uh, and we'll set it up. And I'm like, freaking cool, you know? <laughs> and here I am trying to get a... Uh, uh, adrian paul into a paranormal show you know and you know the paranormal thing kind of went out the window although i did ask him if he ever had a, an encounter with a ghost and uh that from that i said you know I, I should start doing a show where i can talk to people who are inspirational because i mean he was he was very inspiring and uh and then I, it just spawned into life coaches and authors and musicians and all these people. And I get to meet so many great folks and make so many good friends. And it, I, I love doing this. Yeah, no, I could tell you got a passion for it. You do it well, too. You know what I mean? You're the kind of show that I think people come back to. Not a lot of folks have the the kind of uh, what I'll describe as talent, uh, <laughs> but also viewability. You know, like I've watched your shows. They're fun. You know, you can watch them and. You know, and even in some cases, binge them and, and people, I think, will, um, you know, gravitate to shows like that because you get off topic, right? You, 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 we can yeah. start on talking about, oh, you know, how your book's going. And then all of a sudden we're talking about Adrian Paul. We're talking about rock and roll. <laughs> we're talking about movies. We're talking about ghost stories. Like, I don't know if I even told you this. And this isn't a ghost story as much as it is a crazy, like quasi paranormal thing. 
Mm-hmm. But the, the main character in my novel, Damus Alaric, comes from a real life recurring nightmare that I had. Uh, and I don't think, you know, it's paranormal. Uh, but the idea behind him is he, in the book, he sees the future by his God, these ancients, showing him things while he sleeps. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, an ability that some psychics have called honoramacy when they, they, they see the future when they sleep or some will look into a yeah. mirror or a crystal ball or they'll, you know, use cards and things like, well, Damus's was more when he sleeps. And I had something crazy like that happen to me when I was like 16, 17 years old, right before I went to college. Um, you know, I started having a dream about a, a, a figure that was nightmarish coming to me <laughs> while I was sleeping, telling me that it was my guardian angel and I had to do things for it. Uh, but these weren't like the same dream over and over. The dream would pick up where the last one left off. And they weren't every night. They were once every four months, once every three months. And when you're in high school and you're a big bag, I was playing hockey, I was playing football. You know, there's no way I'm going to be, I was scared of it. Like, like for two periods in high school, like after one of these dreams, I would be like, freaking out so I, I took the experience and i just baked it into my novel mm-hmm. uh, but i've been on paranormal shows talking about that i was even on a psychology show and this guy's trying to like you know shrink my 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 brain and, and tell me where he's and he's like yeah i have no idea where this is coming from and it's like you know it was it was a lot of fun a, a lot of fun but those paranormal shows i i am addicted to ghost adventures i watch that religiously i've been watching it for over 10 years religiously I, you know, even, you know, watch the the older shows and things like that and Ghost Hunters when it was around the, its first iteration and things like that, because it's always something that interests me. And when I write my dark fantasy, I use, you know, because there are, there are scenes there that are really freaking terrifying. I'm not talking about like an institution that isn't going to fit within the confines of a, a fantasy world, but right. you, know, you give me a cathedral, you give me a haunted castle, you give me you know, ancient, you know, spirits that are wandering the Irish countryside or whatever. There's a lot of, of, of meat on the bone for a guy like me to, to, to use that in his novels. Right. Well, you know, Keith Richards, he said he would wake up and he, in his dream, he had, was playing a riff on his guitar and he'd start writing it down when he'd wake up in the middle of the night. And uh, a lot of his biggest hits came from dreams. So I don't know if your subconscious is working overtime or you're getting some kind of divine intervention, you know, yeah. Yeah, nor do I, I mean, my stuff, you know, I've had that were things from plot lines that come together when you're thinking about it. And it does drive you, especially when you're sleeping to get up and do something to sit there and write it. No, but at least write something down, physically write it down. Mm-hmm. So you remember, you've got to tackle it in, in the morning. Um, but you know, that, that kind of stuff, you know, I don't know if that's your brain working overtime, you know, and it's just, it's doing it while you're sleeping. It's just putting all this stuff together for you like a computer would. Mm-hmm. Um, or if it it is really something that's, you know, paranormal and, you know, you're, you're tapping into, you know, another realm and, 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 you know, in my case, our guardian angel was, that wasn't a guardian angel was a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and in my book, he becomes a really bad guy. Uh, but this was like, st- I mean, you, you want to talk about craziness. Like I would, you know, to walk to the still water in the fog and he comes walking across the water and tells me he's my guardian angel. And when I didn't listen to him, he beat me up in another dream. When I, when I, tr- I didn't listen to him again, he, you know, he, he would try to bribe me. It was like, it was almost like a, a his own personality. I've never had that in any other kind of dream. You know, how like dreams are sort of like, you know, they're, they're wispy and it's hard to follow along. You don't know how you got there. And in your dream, it makes you feel like, you know, how you got there. When you think about it in real life, you're like, how, well, how did I connect those two things? This was like, it's happening. I'm here. Mm-hmm. I can feel it. Right. And it was just a totally different experience. So paranormal, I don't know. Craziness when you're 18, 16, probably, you know, haven't had one for a while, but I used it. It's scary. I hear people talk about it all the time when I go to shows and, uh, you know, talk about Damus, the character and, and, you know, and how that's some freaky stuff. So <laughs> And maybe a, it's an acid flashback or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no acid. I, I promise you, no acid. That's a little, a little too tough for me. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <it's all> right. <laughs> well, you know, I had a teacher, it was an English teacher, and she would tell us we needed to keep a journal right by our bed. And then every time you have a dream, 
you know, if, even if it didn't make sense, just write everything down and have a dream journal. And I really wished I had done that. Who knows? I might've been able to, to write a book and then I'd be challenging you for the number one spot. <laughs> Amazon bestseller, right? Yeah. No, are you serious? I had a, I had a, um, a very similar teacher in high school. His name was Mr. Bud. And Mr. Bud, if you closed your eyes and thought about your 11th grade uh, imaginative writing or creative writing teacher, that's exactly who he was, right? Just kind of a nerdy guy. Um, he would take notes on stuff that we would brainstorm in class, but it was so much fun. It was like, I'm really in a class. I'm, this is my, you, it, it, you forgot you were in an English class, you know, and it would, he would want you, to, it would make you write. Um, of course, these were stories and it was just a matter of, you know, they were, you were being taught like Mr. Miyagi, like you didn't realize that you were writing better until you looked down and said, wow, I wrote something a lot better than I could have. And it was because you were writing stuff that you wanted to write. It wasn't about, you know, some, you know, crazy Shakespearean thing, even though that would have been okay for me, for most kids in class. So it wasn't, but it was more like, tell me what you want to write about. And we'd sit around in a circle and brainstorm. And, you know, I always teased because Mr. Bud, I thought was like a fake name. I thought he was, you know, Mr. Bud, you know, but it true, it truthfully was, uh, you know, that was his name and a, you know, just a good guy, just a little off center. Uh, but it worked out well. And the class was, was great as well attended and, and enjoyed it. And you know, there were some people that took it so they can, you know, veg out in the back, but most, uh, you know, most folks that, that took it, like me, were involved because they wanted to, you know, to kind of this to be the launch of their career to learn how to to tap into some of that stuff. So, you know, it's crazy that it, and I meet a lot of these people on the road too. like where folks where they get their ideas sometimes are just out of control. Mm -hmm. You know, like you hear about some stuff and sometimes it's a life experience. Other times it's something that they just tried and they're like, I'm going to try this. And, you know, you, you realize that no matter what, there's no logic to creativity. It just happens, you know, when it does and you, you could piece some things together, but I've always found the trick to making my stories better is to bounce ideas off of people. Mm -hmm. Because even though my idea might sound right to me in a group of creative people, they don't have to be writers. They can be, you know, everyday people, but you know, they like storylines or they want to see certain things. And, you know, when they get a chance to beta read your stuff or, you know, they get a chance to participate when you're stuck in the mud and you're like, I, I need to figure out how this ends, you know, you know, going to some friends or other creatives as I'll call them has really helped me open up the doors. Uh, in some cases, the floodgates to, to good ideas that you can then embed in your novels. So it's good stuff. Well, I think the brainstorming part of it is like my favorite part because you you could spawn off and come up with an idea for something totally different just for throwing all those ideas in the hat you know i've, I've got several ideas but i'm not a writer so you know if you you want to throw them at me i am i'll do it with you we'll, we'll make it work we'll make okay. it work we'll split, we'll split royalties hey that'll work <laughs> I, I, you know sometimes it, it's kind of from dreams or i'm daydreaming you know there's that whenever you're trying to go to sleep and you just rolling things around your head or i wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep i just yeah. think of all kinds of crazy stuff and i just i don't know i'd love to see it down on paper Who knows <laughs> gotta send me your thoughts and i'll right. we'll iterate on it we'll go from there now have you thought about teaching so I actually am starting it uh, this semester at a local community college. Oh, yeah. nice. So I gave a speech at um, a community college last summer, maybe early fall. I want to say like September time frame. Mm -hmm. And it was to a bunch of aspiring authors, you know, 30, maybe 35 people. And the idea was, you know, tell them what you do to find success and a lot of them were independents, right? There were a handful of people there that had a publisher, but most of them were small publishing mm -hmm. uh, you know, outfits. Uh, and so it was like, how can you help yourself market yourself in this giant pool that Amazon's created? And I think that in the last 10 years with the proliferation of independent publishing and Amazon allowing you to print on demand and not have giant stores of, of books in your, in your uh, garage, what it's allowed for is people to go out there and some are better than others at marketing themselves. And so I went up and I started to talk about, 
you know, my principles and what's really driven me to do this. And I do have a publisher, but it's a small publishing house. So like, how do we do this together? You know, and, you know, learning lessons from her, you know, me being sort of a business guy on the side, how do I, how have I taken some of those same business principles and laid them upon my authorship? And, you know, at the end of it, I got approached by uh, one of the, the schools and they said, would you like to, to do a couple of these seminars, one related to the business side of it, you know, how authors can be more effective and sell more books. And the other one more likely, Hey, if you're a sci-fi or a fantasy person, how do you, how do you really sit down and start to write your books? And what, how do you have to think through them? And what, what are the expectations of the industry? And not just, Hey, I've got a good story, really thinking about how you're going to put it together, you know, and the steps of editing and all the kind of stuff that goes on behind the curtain. Right. And, you know, so I'm there to and you know pull the curtain open and I'm hoping, you know, that 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 begets additional opportunities and things like that, too. Oh, yeah. And are are you prepared to be like the next Stephen King or J.K. Rowling or, you know, <laughs> no. you got to think big, man. Come I on. am. I am. So here's the, here's the truth of it all. I um I get questions not like that all the time, but I get off often we're like, well, can you see your stuff becoming a movie or a TV show or whatever? And the yeah. answer is yes. But what I've, I, the, what came out of the blue uh, last spring was the opportunity to turn my realm of Warminster into an augmented reality, virtual reality video game. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think we may have talked about that on our, yeah. our second show. Uh, and that's now in process. And we have our first, um, uh, scavenger hunt that'll come out in the April May time frame where folks can play a character and using the augmented reality piece is sort of a beta test to see how everything's going and we expect a launch in you know late 2024 but you know that's something that I think I haven't seen very many other authors get involved in now maybe some of the big ones their ideas translate into uh, that but I've also seen the opposite of that where there's a there's a new genre it's not new anymore but in the last five years the proliferation of the lit rpg um genre which is literature based on role-playing games like right. you go in your this is my halo experience or this is my Fortnite experience and you write yourself and people read that stuff um and you know and you can call that whatever you want it's its own bucket uh and i can see that as being there but i've always tried to position myself for success but you know, anticipating a meteoric rise like a Rowling or a or a Stephen King is a little bit too much to to plan for. But you know, it you know, I think I've been doing it in the right kind of order, right? Like at first, it was like get the book done, write it well, get it published, and then get it out in the marketplace and promote it. And then the second one was use the resources that you're gathering from social media and other kind of momentum and start to go and hit the bookstores and libraries and you know give speeches. And then this year. You know, for books three and four in the end of the series, it's the Comic-Con tours, it's the book tours and doing something that's more than just regional, something that'll take me around the country and get me some exposure. And, you know, I'm growing in that direction, but I'm also realistic that this stuff takes time. And, you know, really, from what I've been told, you really start to see that level of success when you get to books four and five and you have your own readership. There's a following there that'll come to you. And the idea is, you know, at that point, you know, can that thing really turn into a hockey stick and, and shoot up? Or are you, you know, are you going to be comfortable just continuing down the path that you're going and, you know, writing and hoping that people continue to follow and buy your books? Well, since I've met you, you've had your head on your shoulders. And I know that you, you have planned to take it slow and everything, but, you know, this could turn out to be a pretty big deal, man. I'm hoping so. You know, like, I think that, the you know i'm in that place now where uh i'm getting to the epic ending right everybody wants to get to the epic ending and instead of one book i've got two books that are bridging that uh and so the danger for me is to write something that will bore people and have them not come back for book three or someone that won't come back for book four for the epic ending but what i've gotten is a i've gotten some pretty decent reviews on book two there's a lot of people that um, you know, book one, were rating me three and four that are now rating me four and five on Amazon or Apple books or wherever I go. And, and I've seen, you know, a nice recurrence in sales from my newsletters and my, uh, uh, and my email lists and stuff like that, as I start to continue to build those so from a, with, you know, business goggles on looking this way, you know, it's, it's doing it exact. It, it's coming. The plan is coming to fruition. You know, it's happening, right. you know, and the other side of it is continuing to put out good product. 
and do it fast enough that it really aligns itself well with the um the marketplace that exists for me because when you're writing fantasy um or science fiction you know you don't have lifelong fans in many instances like horror you can write and it's from 8 to 80 you know you've got folks there's a real strong niche in fantasy but a lot of those folks you pick up when they are in my case you know you're talking gen z's and gen alphas um and some millennials uh, because that's that's the target market that reads the stuff. And then there are the lifelong folks like me that have been in the Star Wars and Star Trek since the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, but you're hooked on that when you're younger. You know, it has a tendency to happen at that younger age when your mind's more open to some of these conceptual things, you know, and you, when you get in your hook into them and then you hope that that grows with you in the same way it did for the, the folks from Harry Potter or the, you know, you've seen Game of Thrones now, even though I think that's for a more, mature audience in many respects so it's a different kind of of epic fantasy unlike tolkien which is really targeted for you know i think folks that would be between 13 and 30 um but once you're in you're in you know you're bought in and i'm going to read all that stuff that comes and that's really the hope is like focusing on uh you know that core group building from it and then hoping that they come back my love for fantasy was uh i think started in fourth grade and the reason why is, you know, when we come in after recess, our teacher got this idea that we need to kind of settle down and, you know, because we're out there running and playing and all that kind of stuff. And so she would read to us after lunch and she started reading The Hobbit. And I mean, that just got me hooked. And there was people older than me that were a little bit more into it. And of course, the movie, that cartoon came out. And I started watching it and then, I mean, it was just all about that kind of stuff. Although I didn't get into like role playing games and things like that. I just, I love that genre, especially when I discovered heavy metal magazine. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I sure do. I remember boldly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think when you get it, even at that early of an age, you get into something like that. I think you're in love with it for the rest of your life. I mean, I, I still love the $6 million man, you know, I, I still want to be Steve Austin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. I had a very similar experience and it was a, a little bit more, uh, you know, subdued, you know, I had a fifth grade English teacher and he went out on a medical sabbatical in the last six weeks of the summer when I was before the summer in, in uh, fourth or fifth grade, you know, we got a substitute teacher named Mr. McKinney and he came in and somehow got permission to read us the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit. And that's all we did. That was our, that was the, the finish of our class was reading these classics to us. Uh, and the same thing, I'm of the generation where I saw that sort of um, the, the cartoon, but it was done, I think in part with some of the scenes were done with live action people covered by cartoons, Yep, made it really, really unique. Uh, but the story was so catching and when you're that young and it pulls you in and then that's how I got involved in Dungeons and Dragons. I started playing role playing games of all kinds, you know, just not just fantasy, but sci fi and, you know, aliens and we play Robotech and you know, Star Trek and eventually Star Wars. And of course, D&D was always the constant. It was the one that was sort of like the granddaddy of them all. And it was, a, you know, an homage to, to Tolkien. It was if it weren't for him there would be no Dungeons and Dragons. There wouldn't be a fantasy genre. You know, he did something that was so unique um, and, and it just sort of has taken off and, you know, in its own form and has existed and grown and iterated and, you know, continue to, 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 to be what it is today. And so I think that those kind of circumstances, the one you just described, which was more like calming all the kids down to me, which was like, Hey, what are we doing to these kids for the next six weeks? And it was like, <laughs> oh, I'll read them the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. You know, and it's like, all right, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, you're a, you're a fan. And that's really how I got to where I am, too. It's like the it was almost the same path. And then you get suckered into right around that time. Star Wars was huge. Mm-hmm. Star Trek was coming back. They were maybe making the first movies for Star Trek with the old cast. And, you know, and you, you saw that stuff. And by the time I got into like high school, you've got this next generation of Star Trek. And then you have, you know, the the ideas of. You know, they're going to redo the Star Wars movies and put all the new effects in that they didn't have 10 years ago. And and it just pulls you through. And 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 that's really, 
um, you know, why I've had a, a love of this stuff for as long as it has. It's always, I've always used it as escapism because my day job is so serious that my, you know, this is a way for me to, to unplug and do something that's fun and entertaining. And, and I don't it doesn't have to be this serious stuff that I'm, that I do day to day. So. Yeah. But you know what? You're, you're doing what you love and it may end up, this is all you have to do. You don't have to go to that other job anymore. You got to sacrifice. The goal. That's the goal, man. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, you got to sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice your time and, and, and other things that you might want to do, but it's in the end, it, it'll be worth it. But I can't remember if we talked about this before, but do you remember when they made that, it was like an after school special and it was about the kid that was playing the, the role playing game and, he freaked out and thought he really was in it. And <laughs> yeah, it was called Mazes and Monsters. And yeah. Hanks was the guy who went crazy, you know? <laughs> and that was back when, you know, you had all the moms uh, screaming about satanic rituals. And mm -hmm. the game is so different than that. Literally, anybody that's ever played the game, that that perception is out the window in five minutes. You just realize that all you're doing is really kind of creating a group delusion and, and it's it's instant storytelling. So you have to pick up the plot line and you've got to say what your character is doing in the plot line. And it's not devil worshiping. <laughs> you, know no. I mean? you know, you're fighting the bad guys most of the time. So even if there's a bad creature in it that they don't like, you're usually there to stop it. Right. Like that's the whole point. You're the hero of these stories and it allows people that level of escapism. But I remember that movie. It was, you know, for the time I thought it was, you know, that people were talking about it a lot and I'm sure it was, you know, yeah. kind of the sexy thing to do. And so they grabbed a hold of it and made that, like, like you said, it's like a made for TV movie. Um, you know, and I enjoyed, I was, I watched it, of course, my parents watched it and, you know, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> devil worship, devil worship, where you, you're going to go crazy. And look, that's going to happen with anything, right? You're going to have someone that's crazy about a sport and goes overboard or crazy about, you know, politics and does something nutty as an activist or whatever. You you find those types anywhere and everywhere. And that's more of a mental health thing as opposed to, a, you know, a, a Dungeons yeah. and Dragons thing. <laughs> I know. I just thought that was so ridiculous. I mean, really, other than it being a little more structured, because I guess you've got dice and all that other stuff that goes along with it. How is it any different than guys sitting around a campfire telling stories? It, I'll tell you what it is. It's exactly that. You're, you're, the difference is, is you're trying to scare someone around a campfire or, you know, when you get together and, you know, there's no difference you getting around a poker table with your friends and playing a game mm -hmm. and me getting around a D&D &D table and playing a game. It's the same thing, except mine's in our head as opposed to in a card or on a dice roll for a board game where you're clicking you know, along your, your player piece, along your a Monopoly board or a Risk board. It's the same kind of thing. It's a strategy game meets a little bit of role playing meets a little bit of you know fun with with magic and mysticism and sword and sorcery right and so you just have a good time with it if you like that stuff and that's led to other industries too like mm -hmm. it's crazy like i'll go to these cons and you'll see people that are doing cosplay um and live action role playing or larping where they go and they meet uh in places and play out their their adventures in live action and they dress the dress and they've got you know various things that they use to cast spells and you know, they've got various weapons that they use that are harmless, um, but they go and, and play. And, and I see that all the time. And that's that's going one level deeper than what I've ever done. You know, I was at an event once for LARPing and, you know, even a guy like me that really enjoyed the game, the LARPing stuff wasn't for me, but I gave it a shot and I saw people that it is for them or cosplay. I just did a, you know, you, you go to these places and people will dress up and they'll have, they'll literally go out. There's a stormtrooper unit where mm -hmm. I live. And there's a ghost uh, busters unit. The guy's car is basically a mini Ghostbusters van, has all the Ghostbusters stuff on. They have little divisions and brigades and, and stuff like that. And they just go out to, to you know, I've seen them go to children's hospitals. I've seen them go to, to places for parties and stuff like that. And they enjoy just dressing up. And, you know, you pay for their 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 food and maybe a little bit of their time or whatever. And they show up and, you know, they they appear in someone's Facebook and their Twitter or their yep. Instagram feed and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, they've got the Jedi Academy. Yeah. And, yeah. You, know, all that, you know, I've seen some of these uh, YouTubers and 
whatnot. They're the more mature, I guess they, you'd call them. But they they make fun of people that go out and do the cosplay and all that. But to me, if that's like the, the worst thing you're doing, <laughs> yeah. um, what's wrong with it? You know, yeah. I, just a few years ago, I, I went to uh, a con. I think it was the Dallas one. I don't remember. But anyway, I, I dressed as Spider Noir. And there you go. There was another guy that was dressed as Miles Morales. And there was a little kid, at least I think it was a little kid, dressed as Spider Ham. And none of us knew each other. But there were people, especially when we were close to each other, they would stop us and say, can we take a picture? Can we take a picture? And it was, you know, they couldn't see me. It was it was the costume. Yep. But it still makes you feel good. You know, you just made someone's day. They took a picture with Spider-Man, you know, or what have you. Yep. What's wrong with a little harmless fun like that? Yeah. And I have a, I have a friend. Um, she's a fellow author and she writes in high fantasy. She writes this fae series so it's a lot about like the race called the fae and then she's got some dragons mm -hmm. and things like that too and she's a cosplayer a very well-known cosplayer and they have a, a ginormous following mm -hmm. uh, you know and folks like that, that go to those cons will go around and they're part of the costume contest they're part of the community you know they're there in the same way you have someone dress up to be santa in your parade these folks are coming out as stormtroopers or they're coming out as jedis yeah. or coming out to have a good time um and also be something that's that escapism right everybody escapes in a different way sometimes you're playing you know bingo or doing a crossword or watching football or you know something that might be less mainstream like cosplay i think that i mean you yeah you're kind of holding on a little bit to your childhood but for me especially having grandkids you know i'm my I can play with my grandkids and pretend like whatever they want me to be. But well, I mean, you tell I'm... me the difference here. If I'm wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers shirt mm -hmm. as a man and I have another man's name on my back that says Ben Roethlisberger, how is that any different than me dressing up as, you know, you're, you're it's, it's, it's a wishful. And that also comes from your childhood when you revered these folks and you yeah. idolized them and you wanted to be them and you, you know, hard work will make you there and get there and all that kind of stuff, you know, but it's not that far afield, you know? So every time someone buys a football Jersey or a hockey Jersey or basketball shoes, because Michael Jordan's selling them and I get the same shoes Jordan does. Well, I got the same cape that Darth Vader does. You know? <laughs> What's the difference? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so what? I enjoy dressing up and going to one of these things. I know when it's proper to dress up and when not to dress up. I'm not going to go in, into an office dressed that way. But, uh, I mean, I'm a responsible adult, pay my bills, raise, you know, three kids and take care of a grandkid right now. So, uh, you know, my, my bills are paid. Yep. So, so what if I like to play around a little bit? Yeah, just have some fun. That's what this is all about. However, you want to have fun, right? Keeps you keeps you young, I think. Yeah, and it keeps you involved too. Like there, you know, these like the Miles Morales thing didn't exist ten years ago, right? And and the way Marvel and DC, in particular, is the two greatest universes uh, that are out there. Uh, you know, they they've been able to to reach out to other communities and bring them in. And, mm -hmm. and and be part of the spider verse right or right. be part of what dc is doing and so you'll see next generation supermen you know you'll see next generation like who picks up where batman left off or who picks up where this goes and then, so you'll have these classic heroes but you also have a new brand of, of folks that allow you know for various races and, and they've, they've focused on women and especially marvel i think has done a good job at, at reaching out to um, a lot of those communities that have, and I know that comics in particular are, you know, a, and I see it just because I'm at all these cons in the African-American community is a, it's a huge, huge cultural thing, you know, and it's something that Black Panther and others, you know, have, have been able to capitalize on through the Marvel universe, you know, and some in DC, not as much as Black Panther, it's kind of become uh, it, its own thing. But, you know, I, I even like just seeing the folks that come out to these shows there's if you want to talk about something that just de-identifies you, like you walk around, hey, we're all nerds at that convention. 
right, like, right. I don't care if you're the biggest jock in the world or you're the smallest nerd in the world we're all nerds there trust me i paid money to show up to be with 3,000 other nerds this day right? <laughs> to talk about nerd stuff, you know, bring it on, you know what I mean? I don't care because no one would have even done like when you said Miles Morales, I'm not sure your other friends would know who that is. You're talking yeah. to me though. So I'm on it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like we're nerd talking, right? It's just, right. Like, hey, yeah, it's just a different, uh, different culture. And you'd be surprised the people you see to come to these things. You're just like, really? I didn't know the CEO of blah, blah, blah walked in and wanted to buy my book. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. And yeah. it's a lot of fun. Well, you stay young at heart. It keeps you young for a while. And you know, what is it? Who's it hurting? And yeah, no. And it's become so mainstream. Uh, you know, I think the nerd culture in California uh, has really pushed that forward in the last 10 years. The, like the Facebookers and the Twitter folks. You see a lot of folks that um, that Valley mentality has has bled out. And, and people and these these guys have lots of money. Right. Like some of them, you know, they may not be married yet. They may not ever get married, but they're, they've got lots of money to spend because they've got good jobs. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they come to those cons and they want to have a good time and that's how they do it. And, you know, I would even, you know, go as far to say it's, you know, like when I said before, it has become mainstream. It's a lot more acceptable. People understand it mm -hmm. the way it is. There's a lot less stigma. Uh, around it from from being a nerd you see it in a lot of movies at least one movie even more than that a year has someone cosplaying or some fun thing that's in it. and sometimes it's part of a comedy you know piece of it you know other times it's just you know it's just it's the entire movie uh is is built around it uh because it is its own subculture but it's it's a it's a fun one and most of the time a pretty damn safe one except yeah. for um, tom hanks character in uh <laughs> well stay away from that one a little bit Here's my thing. There's so many people out there that are pushing to separate us for one stupid reason or another. When you've got something like this that brings people together, I mean, honestly, you see somebody in a costume at a at a convention. Do you go up and ask them, did you vote Republican or Democrat? You're right. You don't give a damn. No, it's you out the don't. window. There exactly. Are certain, there are certain levelers to that. Anybody that spent time in the military, you know mm -hmm. what that's like. Everybody's your brother. You know, mm -hmm. anybody that's played a sport and you're on a team, everybody's your brother, you know, and yeah. you get into something like that. It, it is the great leveler, you know, yeah. it really is because we're all living a fantasy and living vicariously through something else that's a group delusion, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that makes this stuff, you know, sexy for me. It really makes it a lot of fun and, and keeps it renewed because there's going to be new stuff every year you know going into it there's going to be a new hot show that you didn't expect or a new character like baby yoda for god's sakes <laughs> yeah. baby yoda all right my wife <laughs> my jock wife my wife who doesn't even read my stuff has more baby yoda stuff and made me watch the mandalorian and made me watch this and she'll come in and say it's baby i need to get my baby yoda time this week and we'll go back and watch them and she doesn't even like it she just watches it for baby yoda you know and oh my just, lord I know it's so sad, but it's true. If she was here, she would be screaming in the background that she agrees, but that's what I mean. And it's like some of that stuff, you know, it just, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Now you see them, you know, or the minions a couple of years ago for kids and, and things like that, or, 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 you know, you get, you know, some of the classics that get reborn like Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse or stuff that they're doing with, uh, you know, sort of like the reboots of, of some of the Marvel characters and things like that. I, it's amazing how that is like, sort of like the great level of people, don't go there and question who you are, where you came from. You're just celebrating your nerddom, your geekdom with, with everybody while you're there. Yeah. Well, it's a way to kind of bridge that, that generational gap too. Like I said, if I took my grandson years ago to go uh, meet Stan Lee, you know, that had to be uh, fun. That was freaking awesome to say the least, <laughs> but you know, I don't listen to their music. I don't I don't get a lot of the shows and stuff they watch, but they like the comic books and you know, so does so does Papa. So we have <laughs> something in common, you know what I mean? Yeah. Something you could you could hang out with them about. They 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 uh they like it and it's something you can do and you could talk to them about it without having to worry about whether or not you could play the video game or what's what's the latest and greatest in, in their uh their their classes and stuff like that. It's something that everybody can identify with. Yeah.
I mean, and I don't play video games. I don't. I, last game I played was probably Pac Man. So. Oh my. Oh. <laughs> You just dated yourself there, my friend. Yeah, I know. I remember the first Pac-Man machine coming to the little store behind us. Uh, uh, okay, I was going to say the Atari version was right around when I started kicking off. So a couple of years after you. <laughs> the, you know, people are listening to this. and They're going, okay, I want to know more about this book. And I mean, I'm, we've kind of mentioned a few things here or there. But does, how far can you kind of explain into the book? Yeah, so I'll... I'll a snippet on each of them so book one is the book called the last keeper mm -hmm. uh and it's a fantasy story about a young man named damis alaric who has a series of recurring nightmares that brings him closer and closer to the villain in the novel mm -hmm. a man named great taurus and he and great taurus have this unspoken rivalry one that damis doesn't understand in book one and has to learn about and find out why great taurus is hunting him you know book two is voridin's lair uh and it's sort of like the segue between um, you know, the the first book, which is a shocker, and why is this stuff happening to really learning to the secrets behind it and things that happened even before he was born or when he was young and why he has his powers. Um, and then the group that comes around him to help him uh, and some of their backstories. And then book three, The Trillius Gambit, which will be the one that comes out in March, is really focused on advancing all of those plot lines. We get to see, you know, Damus finally take control of his powers and start to rival Grey Taurus. We get to see the descent of Grey Taurus into something that's uncontrollably bad. Um, and we have to ask ourselves the question, is in book four, is there a spot where Grey Taurus can be redeemed or is it too late for him? And in the case of Damus, it's more, you know, does he put all of his stuff together and mature fast enough to fight this great rival, you know, to the benefit of the realm? So book four will be called Echoes of Ghostwood and that'll come out in the summer. Uh, but if uh, folks are interested in the realm of Warminster or the Warminster series, you know, they could find me at jvhilliard.com or I'm on a bunch of socials that can go at JV Hilliard books or just JV Hilliard and find me on places like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, TikTok. As crazy as that might sound, you know, I'm not much of a TikToker, but I have people that TikTok for me. <laughs> ah, I need someone who can do that for me because I, I started putting videos and stuff on there and i just i give up there's so many social media sites i'm, I'm just like and can't. they keep coming they keep coming and you know the, the the you know if you're on facebook you're old you know what i mean if you're on twitter you're political if you're you, know, you just can't win you know so i try uh -huh. to i try to focus on a couple that make most sense for me uh and um you know i had a one one in a year and a half i've had one uh you know uh you know social media effort go viral i had a guy named dave prokopek who's a local cinematographer to me and he did a um my book trailers which is sort of like a movie trailer for books you put them out and you put them on your website and you throw them out on social media and people watch them and if mm. they like them they'll have a tendency to buy the book and at the end you put a little qr code and they can zap it with their phone and just buy it from there it takes you to amazon or apple or wherever and you just go and buy your stuff download it or gets delivered to your house or you listen to it on audiobook uh and dave put this thing together and the video itself didn't go viral the making of the video went viral and he had two hundred seventy-five thousand hits to his instagram account because um you know people saw him making what he described as sort of like his own harry potter castle which is the castle in the novel uh one of the castles i should say called the bridge uh and it's this ominous scene and, and once people saw the trailer it you know, it converted into book sales, but it was really Dave doing something behind this. She's showing his mom, like holding this, you know, this Viking ship and with this like fog blowing in the background, wondering what's going on and like him spray painting this castle. And then he, then he said it, the castle wasn't big enough. It didn't look good enough to him. So, so he just built a second castle on top of that castle and just kept building a mountainside and, you know, all this kind of stuff. He built a stream with a 3d printer and stuff. And he did this thing in, in, you know, and it had, you know, all of these hits and it's the one thing and i didn't even do it you know what i mean that was the problem like i've been doing like you know all of this social media stuff for over a year almost two years and i can't get a, more than a couple hundred views to any post i put out there I know. Maybe I'm making of and wow you're like wow i get it people people aren't going to read my stuff but they'll watch his stuff and so you know book three will have a nice trailer to it book four will have a nice trailer to it and dave's got a he's got a permanent job moving forward now based on the success of that trailer 
Man, it's too bad that this couldn't have converged a few years ago because a buddy of mine, he had built this castle and it was basically a tiny home, but he had it on a trailer and we took it to a con, as a matter of fact. No kidding. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that's how I met uh, Danny Trejo and uh, God, I forgot who else. There was a few actors that actually came up to check the, 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 the castle out. And in anyway, he had it set up where there was bunk beds and he had a TV in there with video games set up. And uh, so we're speaking oh, about it in past tense, so I'm assuming the castle no longer exists. No, he sold it. Uh, he he used to like rent it out for birthday parties. Oh, where, yeah, that's cool. You know, the kids would have it for a weekend and it was it was interactive. Like there was I forgot it some kind of light. Thing, like almost like laser tag yep. that would set different stuff off in there and other little things you can do in it it had the you know the air conditioning the whole nine yards right yep and it i just think that would have been so cool for you to made some kind of little video in that would have been i, I could have taken it with me on my my uh my adventures yeah man <laughs> that was that was a blast. <laughs> well, if you ever does one again, you got to let me know. I'd love to be able to film something with that. I think that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, if he ever does it again, that guy is, man, he's so busy. But you mentioned the, the lady that wrote about the, the Faye and all that. What, what's her name? Her name is Danielle M. Orsino. And I'd be more than happy to make an intro if you want. She'd be a great interview. She, This is the truth. I had her on my YouTube channel. She not only is an author, but she's also formerly a nurse. Um, but one of the most interesting things I found out about her is she's a stunt woman. And when you see her, you meet her, you're like, what, like what's going on? And she's got the like, karate medals out the yin yang. Like she's, you know, a martial arts champion, stunt woman, author and nurse. And you're like, how do you fit all that into in your day job? Like, like, how does that, how does that work for you? And, and I got a chance to meet her. She's a, you know, just a, a, a fantastic interview. It's somebody that um, also kind of runs sidecar to what I'm doing. We're in the same, we're on the same highway, just in a little different lane. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you know, we pass each other every now and then and, and, and wave. She's a, you know, and, and she would be somebody that I, I think your fans would respond to. If they like my stuff, they will definitely like Danielle's. I'll, I'll make that intro for you. Is it Bertha Faye novel? It is. That's her I, series. I interviewed her. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, so that's crazy. That's when crazy. you mentioned all that, I said, I wonder if it's the same lady. Yeah, it's the same. same. She's so cool. She is. And she's the cosplayer, too. Like she, she gets called around her like she usually does the Wonder Woman thing at the Galaxy Cons. Mm -hmm. uh, that's her sort of claim to fame. But she does in my Altered Reality magazine. We just printed a couple of her new cosplay stuff with, uh, you know, her her designers and her makeup stuff that she went out and did it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, you know, from you know just sort of bringing to life some of the characters in her novel. And she could do that with other people's stuff. And, you know, just a just a very cool person to deal with. And, and um uh, you know, that's somebody you don't want to mess with, too. She'll kick you in the head. Yeah. <laughs> you well, make a fun out of her for cosplaying, you're going to be in trouble. Well, a three-year-old could beat me up in my condition. <laughs> so. <laughs> but she is a walking encyclopedia of nerddom. She is. She is. She's. She lives it, man. So, like, yeah. hey, if it's a lifestyle these days, like I said. Well, we had talked about her coming back on the show and just talking about that you know star wars and marvel and dc because well she's definitely got her opinions on it I'll say. she does <laughs> she's been steeped in it she got in trouble at a as she tells me a story uh, told me a story i should say where uh i guess she was wearing her wonder woman outfit which is a dc costume and approached someone who's a writer for marvel and he was like i, I, I can't i can't like division of church and state kind of thing you know and i i, I find that kind of funny uh, but by the same token, any nerd would do that. They, they'll they argue Star Wars versus Star Trek or Star Trek versus Star Trek the new generation. And you can't you can't like both, which is BS, by the way. You know, I like both Trek and Wars. And I do too. You know, too bad if you if you you know I'm trying to be I'm not trying to be neutral about it. They're both good. They're just two different stories. And why would I not like one story because I like the other? That doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. 
spaceships, travel, new cool stuff, adventures. Yeah, I'm in. I'm down. One has a lightsaber. The other has photon torpedoes. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm good. <laughs> you know, pull me in, right? Right. I mean, I, I knew about Star Trek before I knew about Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And I mean, because remember, they used to have the reruns that come on TV when we were kids. Yep. And lo and behold, Star Wars came out. And no, oh, I was addicted to that for sure. I still I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched those movies over and over again. Yeah. Now, if you're into them, you're into them. Right. I, oh, yeah. I what I find crazy is to think that I still run into people that have never seen them. <gasps> you know, what? and I'm like, how is that even uh, just you have to know what they are right you do you do know who darth vader is right you know and right. you know i don't like that stuff i don't watch it. i've never seen star wars like how by accident how have you not seen it you know right. by, seriously by accident you're gonna see it at some point in your life and i still run into those folks so my, my mom who doesn't care for any of that stuff has seen star wars and star <laughs> trek so <laughs> <laughs> by god she's in her 70s so get on the ball people <laughs> all right so you got the got one coming up in march and then you got one coming up in you said june july yeah july yeah, I'm sorry, the july. final final chapter echoes of ghostwood would be book four and then the first series will be done you know and beyond that you know we'll see i've got some ideas for some standalone novels for origin stories for some of the more popular characters i also have some ideas for a future series if my publisher will allow me uh to go down that road I, i've got i kind of already know how this one ends and where i want to go with the next one but you know i gotta have those conversations after we're done with number four and see how that goes as well and you know by then i'm hoping that uh you know we'll we'll find a lot of commercial success with it as well as um you know the ideas of you know maybe in between series doing these individual standalones which i think will be a lot of fun you know, going back and kind of looking at some of the you know the characters and and uh going a little deeper dive into their background so people could see how they they met them and they liked them and how they got to where they are you know and, and stuff and i think that'll be that would be a lot of fun well i'll put all the links in the description as as i usually do thank you sir appreciate it oh yeah hey can you uh Email me the the QR code. Will do. I, I'd love to be able to share that out too. That'd be yeah, pretty cool. Ha- happy to do that. Oh. Man, I, I, thank you again for coming back, man. We, hey, you got that next one. We got to set up for just yep. before that comes out. I'll, I'll ping you. You know, we'll, maybe we get together in June and and we'll we'll talk about the the last and final in the series and go from there. That'd be awesome. And I'll let you know when I'm in Texas and, and hopefully yeah. it's Austin. I'll swing in and we got to, we got to go grab some lunch somewhere catch up. Oh yeah. Well, you just let me know Dallas or, or Houston, Austin. I'll be there. It's going to be one of them. I'll let you know for sure. Thank you again for having me on today. Oh yeah, of course. And also want to thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel, I appreciate you stopping by and please come back, hit that subscribe button from my regulars. Hey, you guys are wonderful because you make this possible for me to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.